I'm John Scalzi, and this is Starter Villain. It's an average Joe inherits his mysterious uncle's James Bond supervillainy business. Things go from there. Can we start the discussion with a conversation about what may be the best book cover of all time? <laughs> yes, absolutely, let's have that conversation. Is this what you always imagined you wanted the cover of this book to be? I honestly didn't know what the cover was going to be. While I was writing it, um, a lot of things lent itself to that. I mean, it is very much of a book that uh, is taking uh, a uh, sort of unswerving, sarcastic a hit to the James Bond villains and stuff yeah. like that, so I figured that might be uh, something along that line. But when they showed me the current cover, which is done by a artist named Tristan Elwell, I, the first time I saw it, I just laughed, right? And like a good laugh, yeah. not like a, oh my God, I can't believe they're gonna saddle me with this cover. <laughs> right. And so I loved it. Uh, we showed it to our marketing people, the marketing people loved it. We showed it to the publisher of Tor Books and she loved it. And here's yeah. a fun fact, when the publisher really likes the cover of your book, guess what? That's the cover of your book. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And then you're you're did, done. But the title was well. Mm. Obviously, did, was it a struggle? Because it seems to fit pretty perfect. No, the title was almost there before the rest of the book was. The concept of a starter villain. Now, there are two ways that common culture thinks of a starter villain. If you play video games at all, a starter villain is the very first boss you meet, the one that you're gonna like, you know, get a little, get a little workout for, but then there are bigger villains along the way. And in this case, like for the book, it is, this is the first time this fellow has encountered the world of villainy. He's brand new at it. Uh, he has no idea what he's supposed to do. And so he's just at the beginning, he's a starter villain. One of the things that I like doing in, in my books kind of examine a lot of the cultural tropes that we have uh, and go, why? Why is this? So for example, with Starter Villain, if you think about the James Bond villain, like if their plans were like actually successful and they were not you know, thwarted by uh, Jimmy Bond throwing them into a volcano right. or whatever, right. you're like, okay, what then, right? It's like you now rule the world Congratulations, now you have to worry about crop outputs <laughs> in Uganda, right? Because right? Right. if you don't, then people are gonna starve. There's just, like, no one ever talks about all the work. Yep. And so what's real fun for me is to look at the mechanics of, if you take these tropes that we all know and we all love, and you kind of extend them to, how would they really work in the real world? Yeah. Then it becomes interesting. Why does a supervillain have a volcano lair? It's not because it's like a secret anymore. We have spy satellites that are going over all the time, but there's a very good reason. Geothermal energy. You can have all the energy you want comes from Mother Earth and you can, for any villainous activity that you want, it makes perfect sense. So once again, take those tropes, extend them out. Why would you have all the villains have cats? I have a very good answer for yeah. that within the context of the book. Yeah. You just do it again over and over and over. And after that happens, then a story kind of appears out of it yeah. because now you've set up all the chess pieces and now you can go ahead and play the game. And you have to throw your every man into that mix. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's always good to have a uh, an every man or every person, you know, it doesn't have to be a mm -hmm. dude. Uh, and it's good to have um, a character that the audience can sort of empathize mm -hmm. or sympathize with. And in this particular case, Charlie, um, he's someone who is kind of down on his luck. He used to be a journalist. Mm -hmm. Yep, there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, he's now working as a substitute teacher. He came home to take care of his ailing father. His ailing father has passed away, and now he's kind of in an uh, uh, economically shaky position. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden, this lifeline, so it seems, is mm -hmm. being thrown by this mysterious uncle who he hasn't seen or heard of since he was five years old. Um, but of course, whenever you're thrown a lifeline just out of the blue, it's like, okay, if I tug on this lifeline, what's on the other end of it? Yeah. And that's what. That's Charlie what gets it is. to get discovered. So cats really are the best supervillains. Cats really are. I mean, you've met a cat, right? Uh, that's like, right. I was like, the cat's like, I love you, but I will eat you. That's right. If I'm ever trapped in the house, <laughs> right. and it's you or me, right. it's gonna be you. And you couldn't do this with dogs. No, no, absolutely not. You know, the, the thing is, 
dogs are dogs are the best sidekicks, right? They are. You know, they're yeah. gonna be they're gonna be like, what adventure are we on? I'm totally ready for this adventure. Let's go. Oh boy. Whereas the cat is like, you're gonna die. I'm gonna stay over here while you die, and I'm gonna laugh right. when you die. And then I'm going to eat. And then I'm going to eat you when it's all done. Right. So you actually dedicate this book to your cat. I do. Did they critique you? <laughs> <laughs> so I have one cat in particular, uh, Spice, who, so I'm at my desk and I'm typing and she's always sitting right mm -hmm. there. And she's like, really? You're going to use that word? Do you think you need that many adverbs? I don't think you do. <laughs> you know? Oh, what a, what a, what a hackney uh, line that you've done there. Yeah. Good to see that your years of education are finally paying off. <laughs> so I, she doesn't say any of that, but of course she gives you that look, and I'm like, oh, and that tail it. when it wags, and it's just kind of a sarcastic, right? Like she's like, really, yeah, really. This is this is the choice you made here. <laughs> right. you this think is that's the best you can do. So yeah, that's that's spice, and then there's sugar, who is the pretty pretty princess cat. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. like give me attention, give me attention, give me attention, go away. Right, yeah. and then there's Smudge, who, uh, if you look at the author photo, you can see him on my shoulder trying to eat my meal. Yeah, um, he's basically a chaos demon. Yeah, and 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 we love him for that. It's yeah. like we have a dog, a Charlie, the, which the, which the Good character name. is named yeah. after, uh, and uh, and so Charlie will pick a fight with Smudge, and they'll play around and eventually I'll be like, all right, Charlie, leave the cat alone. And then as soon as the cat, and the dog was like, okay, I'll be done. And then the cat attacks. I'm like, no, Charlie, I changed my mind. Go after him because <laughs> that's right. clearly, you know. That's right. And the, he's uh, the instigator. And that dynamic is perfect for kind of hero villain kind of dynamic, right? Oh, absolutely, right? absolutely. You know? Humor always runs rampant in your books. Sure. And I wonder, is that by design? And could you even write these books without humor? There was one time where I wrote a story and I did it specifically not using humor. It's a novella that I wrote called The God Engines. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote it to do writing that I knew I was not necessarily good at, yeah. and also to avoid the things that I was good at, which can become crutches. Mm. So not a lot of humor, not mm. a lot of dialogue, mm. Um, mm. and just basically trying to uh, write something that was kind of a downer. So uh, I have done it. I had a blast writing it. And at the end of it, people were like, I read your uh, novella, The God Engines. Do you need a hug? Right, and I was like, no, no, it was great. Yeah. But for me, humor, I think, is just a natural uh, part of who I am as a person. Um, I tend to be, um, you know, uh, quick with a comment, and I try to be, uh, you know, humorous because it's a great way to get people to connect with you uh, very quickly. Um, I think there's a danger with that. Um, I do have uh, a saying, which is the failure mode of clever is a-hole, um, and I think that humor is an aspect mm -hmm. of that as well, where you're like, oh, I'm gonna be funny regardless of whether or not I step on people's right. feelings. So there's a, there's, a, there's a line there. But I have found that humor has done uh, extremely well for me. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in science fiction, there was a long period of time, not so much now, but there was a long period of time where they were very suspicious of humor. Right. And so uh, it took a, actually a fairly long time before I could put out a book, which was Red Shirts, where we could just say, no, no, this is a funny book. Yeah. And that went on to win uh, the Hugo Award. So it proves that even in science fiction, people like to have, have humor. So you've tackled space adventure, uh -huh. a society that cares for the well-being of giant monsters. Sure. The business of supervillains. Sure. It sounds like you're taking your imagination from when you were a kid and you've turned it into this wildly successful business of writing these books. I'm glad it looks like it was planned because from my point of view, um, I am an accidental novelist. Mm. I started off as a I started off as a journalist. My very first job right out of college was I was a film critic. Uh, for the Fresno Bee uh, newspaper in California. Mm -hmm. And as far as I was concerned, I always wanted to be in journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to do the movie reviews. I had a column when I was 23 years old, mm -hmm. a newspaper column, which was a terrible idea. 
who was the person who thought it was a good idea to give a 20 something, you know, a column where it's like, let me tell you my opinion. That's kids. right, because I've lived a lot. And I know a lot at 23. Oh, so yeah. let me impart my wisdom upon you. This was exactly it. And of course, I was the guy who would be like, of course, I can tell you everything. I have the wisdom of the ages has downloaded into my brain. But this was what I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. And then uh, circumstances changed. I went to AOL, where I worked uh, there for a couple of years as their in-house editor and writer. And then I went freelance. And so basically what happened was I wrote a novel just to see if I could. And then having done that, um, I tried another one. And then when it was sold, uh, I said to my wife, uh, Christine, I said, look, just so you know, no one makes money writing novels. The plan is I will do this every couple of years. I'll have a novel come out and it'll be fun. And I get to say, look, I have a novel. But my money will be made doing what I was doing at the time, which was freelancing and working with corporate clients. And then Old Man's War, my first novel that was published, right. took off like a rocket. Yeah. One thing led to another, and now I'm a novelist full time. It's yeah. like, guess I was wrong. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> and very happy to be wrong. Right. right? No, don't get me wrong. This this whole this whole novel writing thing is is a delight, it's, but it is but it is unexpected, yeah. and I I kind of love it for that. Yeah. 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 I mean, those turns in life that you never expect. Oh and no, then, no. It's look, just if I had had my way, I would have been the next Mike Rodko. Right, and right. Uh, and it turns out I get to be the first me. It was a real gift to have you on the show today. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you doing this, John. All right. And thank you for watching A Word on Words. I'm Jeremy Finley. Remember, keep reading. Thank you for making Charlie a struggling journalist. Sure. What is it about the profession, do you think, makes such good characters? Is it because we're all essentially train wrecks? <laughs> It's because we're all handsome and smart. That's I don't it. even know what you're That's talking about it. about this train wreck thing. Right.